Our lesson today is entitled Guilt, and guilt is something that we all deal with, and it feels like a mountain on your back. And people deal with it in so many different ways, but some ways are good and some ways are not so good. But we've got to learn to deal with guilt. If we don't deal with guilt, that mountain comes down upon us and presses us to the ground and keeps us from making progress in our lives. And so guilt is something we deal with. There was a man, it was during the times of the Depression, and he had owned a bakery, and he had had that bakery for more than 10 years, and he was doing really good in the bakery. And people came and bought his goods, but during the Depression, nobody had money to buy his goods. And he had to close his business, and the bank, uh, well, the bank foreclosed on his building and took it away, and he lost his livelihood, so he went to work for the YMCA. But during the Depression, the YMCA lost its funding too. And finally, through the New Deal, he got a job working for the Works Project Association, or the WPA, during the Roosevelt administration. And that was something my grandfather also worked for the WPA during that time. I think a lot of people did because that was the only jobs out there in the world to get the economy moving. When all that was over with, he needed a job. But the only job he could get was being a janitor in the schools. Well, he had four daughters. And the four daughters went to elementary school, and they knew their dad went to work early in the morning, and they knew that he was home early in the afternoon, but they didn't have a clue where he worked or really much about it. They went through junior high, nothing happened, but the first child to get into high school was in the lunchroom one day and she heard her dad's name called when somebody spilled milk and he walked over with a mop to mop it up and the girls at the, her table said, do you know that man? And she says, I don't know him. And then she could almost feel a tear in her eye, but uh, she, she thought they were being demeaning towards him and everything like that. And she, she was a little embarrassed at that point in time Later, she regretted it. Well, just a couple of years before this man died, his daughter went to him and said, you know what happened when I went to high school and the milk was spilled and they called your name and uh, these girls asked me if I knew who you was and I, I told them I didn't. I'm ashamed of that. You know what he said? He says, guess what? I knew that all those years ago. <laughs> and you've lived with that guilt for a long time. I forgive you. Well, we, we face guilt in our lives. And guilt is something is defined as responsible for a crime or doing something bad or wrong, the state of one who has uh, committed an offense, especially consciously. Now, we talk a lot about our conscience. And the Bible talks about our conscience as well. And a guilty conscience is something that God gives us that is good. It should help us to reflect upon things, but guilt is a monkey on our backs. And guilt is something that some people carry way too long. And we've got to get rid of guilt to be right with God. And so some people begin by drowning our guilt. They drown it out. And they will use alcohol to drown out their guilt. And alcohol doesn't. There were many TV shows that they would go do their work to the day, and then in the evening, whenever work was done, they'd rush to the bars to get a drink, and that was supposed to solve all their problems. But it doesn't solve their problems, and it doesn't get rid of guilt, and alcohol will never get rid of guilt. Neither will pills that people take that... Guilt will cause them to uh, take pills, and even sometimes they even do cocaine, but that will not get rid of the guilt. Really, we're trying to escape ourselves and drown our pangs in our own guilt, and so guilt causes people to do things that's not very smart. It gets them into trouble. It causes more problems than it solves, and so that's the wrong way to deal with guilt. So we need to learn ways people deal with guilt. There's a lot of ways that people have dealt with guilt, 
But the first thing that they do is deny. They say, I don't have a problem. In Titus 1 and 16, it says they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. And so they say, I've got it under control. They are denying that they have a problem. They're denying that the guilt is affecting their life. They're denying that it exists. And when you deny it and you say you've got it under control, you definitely don't have it under control. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 22, it says, Though you wash yourselves with lye and use much soap, your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. And so we see this is happening there. A lot of times when a lady is raped, she will go and take a shower rather than go into the hospital. Really what she should do is go to the hospital so that they can collect evidence. But something shameful causes us to try to wash it away. And, and this type of washing doesn't get rid of guilt. It doesn't get rid of the problem. It still exists. Another way is deflecting it. It can't be my fault. And that's what we say. And we find this in Adam. It was the woman you gave me. And Eve said it was the serpent that tempted me. So it can't be our fault. And that is a common thing that I see today. There's a lot of people that will blame everybody else but themselves. I, I had an incident yesterday. I couldn't get into the workout place, and I called the guy who's in charge of that workout place, and I said, we can't get in. And he said, you know, well, it's the computer's fault. It's, it's uh, the system must be down or something. I said, well, are you going to do something about it? Or are you going to come up here and let us in? Well, I'll work on it. Well, he called me back later and told me that he had it fixed and that, that the doors were open. But that guy, he was the manager over it, but he didn't really want to get, get up and he didn't want to come out there and he didn't want to do it. It can't be my fault, you know, but I'm the one where the buck stops. And sometimes we have to own up that we are responsible for something and that we have to own up to it. A lot of times that's a big thing. So we try to deflect it onto others. In 2 Corinthians 7, in verse 10, it says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regarded, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You see that word in red, leading to? If we have godly sorrow and we have repentance, we don't have salvation because it says it's leading to salvation. That means we're not saved at the point that we believe, and repent, it's going to take the, all the steps, getting all the way into the waters of baptism where the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin, but it leads us towards it. It's a good start in getting us to get rid of the, the, the problem we have with guilt. So I have this chart here. Worldly guilt, deny or blame, and the outcome is death. But godly guilt produces repentance and salvation. So we can use that guilt in a positive way to do something right, to cause us to repent, and then it leads towards salvation. That is important. Another one the way to deal with guilt is the one that we need to do is to turn to God for redemption. Only God can redeem our sin. Only God can take care of our guilt problem. Only God can give a permanent solution. In 1 Peter 3 and 21, it says, There is also an antitype which now saves us baptism, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see here that it says baptism saves us. And it is the answer of a good conscience before God. An answer of a good conscience before God means that it cleanses, it cleanses our conscience so we don't have to live 
with the dread of the guilt that we faced in our lifetime, that we get things taken care of in that way. So as we turn to God from redemption, we here's what we say, I'm a sinner, I need the cleansing that comes from God. We've all sinned, we've all short, short of the glory of God, we're all in that condition until we come to God. We are a sinner, we're lost, and we need saving, and I need the cleansing that comes from God. That's what we need to say. That's what we need to understand. So how do we get rid of the guilt? The first thing is to mark the guilt. It's, it's to admit that it happens, uh, admit that we own it, not try to pass it off to somebody else, but to mark the gift. In Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies and your tongue has muttered perversity. So we got a sin problem there and we realize that sin separates us from God. It, it, there's, there's God over here, there's us over here, but there's a valley in between and we need something to take care of that to get us in a right relation with, with God. In Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, it says, At is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues. They have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness and their feet are swift to shed blood. It reminds me of uh, in Proverbs where it talks about the seven things that God hates and one of those is hands that shed innocent blood. So this is talking about our guilt and how it faces us. But look at the next verse. Destruction or misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. If you follow the ways of the world, you don't have the grace of God, the mercy of God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So we mark the guilt. That no fear of God before their eyes. Sometimes people don't have their eyes open to focus on what's going on in their lives. And they don't realize their condition as being lost. They don't realize without God, they don't have the hope of eternal life. And so we've got to mark the gift. We've got to realize, we've got to own up to it, and we've got to do what's right. The second one is to mark the anguish. Anguish is great distress. In Proverbs 32, verses 2 through 4, Blessed to who is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groanings all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. That drought of summer is part of the anguish that he faces. This is David talking. He had sinned with Bathsheba. He had Uriah killed he was definitely in the wrong, and Samuel came to him and told him a story. It was a third-person story, and then when he realized he was talking about himself, he, he felt like he was in a drought. He felt like he was in the midst of pain. He felt like he was going on. He, 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 he desperately wanted to feel right. He wanted to get his sins taken care of, and so he... Realize this as he writes these words. I've got to do something about it. I've got to get right with God. So anguish is causes us to have physical suffering. Physical suffering because a lot of times anguish can cause us to have internal problems. Because it weighs us down. It carries us down. It makes us miserable. And disobedient hurts the health. And so we realize that. The second thing is there's emotional suffering. 
This emotional suffering affects us in the way that we relate to one another and the way that we feel towards each other and disobedient manifests misery. It makes us miserable. And, and if we live in that state, then we're, we're just miserable and we've got to do something about it. And the third one is spiritual suffering and disobedience delivers a drought. Sometimes there's a drought in people's lives, in their spiritual life, because they don't stay focused on God, and, and, and something happens in their life, and things change during their life, and they got to turn back to God. they got to realize, I can't live this way. I need to get out of this drought. I need to get in church. I need to do what's right. I need people to help me out in this Christian journey, and we are a family that helps each other out in our journey. So what are we to do? The third thing is to mark the grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is what God gives us because he had Christ die on the cross for our sins. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 40 it says, And the child grew, this is talking about Jesus, and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. God's riches, grace was upon Jesus. He is going to be the author of grace for us. He's going to give us that grace in the way that we can live with him. So we've got to mark the grace, what God does for us. In John 1 and 14, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so we see there that we need that grace, and we need the truth of God's word to guide us so that we can get rid of the guilt problem that we have. In Acts 20 and verse 32, it says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the world of his grace, the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so we're to be built up in the word of God. We've got to trust God's word and put it primary in our lives. We need to read God's word and apply it to our lives. And it's going to give us an inheritance, eternal life, to those who are sanctified. We're sanctified, made right before God. Sanctified is to be made right before God through the blood of Christ. In John 8 and 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so we need to go to God's word as our source. And in John 20, verses 30 and 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, but these are written in this book, but these are written that you may believe, oh, which are not, he did many other things which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So it says there we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and we know that he did all these miracles, he did all these things on earth, and if the books couldn't contain all the things he did, but what we have is sufficient for us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that we might have life in his name if we're obedient to his will. In Acts 17 and verse 30, it says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. I like it in the King James Version where it says, And these times of ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And so we see here that God knows us and he, he's not going to overlook our ignorance forever because now we should know what we ought to do and we ought to repent and turn to God. So God is saying you've got to get to the point where you are responsible for your own actions and towards your relationship with God. In Luke 12 and verse 8 it says, also I say to you that whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will confess before the angels of God. And so it says there that we must confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That helps us with our guilt problem. In Acts 2 and 38, then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that, but it's saying that we've got to repent, but we've also got to be baptized. Be baptized for the remission of sins. That's where the waters of baptism 
symbolizes the blood of Christ that cleanses us from our sins. And in 1 Peter 3.21, there is an antitype which now saves us, baptism. So it says baptism saves us, not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so as we see these things, we see there that we must be baptized in order to contact the blood of Christ so that we can have a clear conscience before God, and that takes care of our guilt problem. In Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's important, that blood of Jesus. Uh, by a new and living way which he consecrated to us through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. The picture there depicts the curtain in the temple that was rent from top to bottom. No man could have done that. I mean, he had the tallest and tallest of ladders. It was really way up there, but it was rent from top to bottom when Jesus died on the cross to give us, through the, his blood, a way to the holiness place of God. There was the holy place and the most holy place that gives us direct access through the most holy place to God, and we do not have to go through the priest, but we can pray directly to God. In their day, they had a relationship where the priest would offer sacrifices for them to take care of sins, but Jesus offered himself once for all so that we can have eternal life through the blood that he shed, and he meets us in the waters of baptism to wash our sins away in that regard and to give us a clean conscience before God. Continuing on, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's talking about baptism there. But our conscience there, our evil conscience is changed whenever we become a Christian. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Our purpose in assembling is to stir up love and good works to help each other on this journey towards heaven, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. We build each other up by assembling with each other. Lieutenant General James Robinson, Robbie was the way they called it, Risner, was a prisoner of war in Vietnam for, four, for five years. The first four years he was in a cell of total darkness. It was cinder blocks. Barely enough room for him to be in there. Barely enough room for him to lay down. It was total darkness. Occasionally, occasionally they would open the door and give him some food and give him some water. Just enough to sustain life. But he could talk to no one. No one talked to him. He could see no one. He was in total darkness for four years. That was hard. Very hard for him. But he said if he would lay down on his left side, press his ear as hard as he could to the ground, he could see a little crack of light. And out of that crack of light was a leaf. And that leaf gave him courage to stick it out because he knew there was life outside and someday he hoped to see that life again. As cruel as it was for him, he understands what it's like to be in total darkness. And that's what waits for people who do not belong to God, total darkness, away from God and not in his presence. We need the light of Christ to light our way to give us the glory that we can have with him. The world is often characterized by disappointment, disease, and death. The worst but the worst condition is separation from God. Our sin is what separates us from him and creates a wall between man and God. We've got to break down that wall between us and God by being obedient to Jesus Christ. I told you there was a, a guff over here and a guff over here, and the only way to get from one side to the other is through Jesus Christ. 
And it was through his death on the cross that he opens the way for us to have eternal life with him. It says there, we united with him in the likeness of his death. Whenever one is baptized, they are baptized in the likeness of his death and rise to walk in newness of life. It takes our guilt and it cleanses us of all our guilt so that we can be right with God. There's two ways to look at things right now. One is if you're not a Christian, you can become a Christian. You can, you need to hear the gospel. You need to believe it. You need to repent. You need to confess Christ before men, and you need to be baptized. The other is if you're already a Christian and you've fallen by the side or you're still dealing with guilt and you want that guilt to go away, we can pray for you and help you in your journey. The Bible says in 1 John that the blood of Christ continually cleanses us from our sins. So today, if you have a need, won't you come while together we stand and sing. I am resolved. No.